I'm Silke Kroll, I'm the chair and host of this session on uh, toxi uh, toxicity and safety in nanomedicine, which is a quite important topic. I already said it's quite interesting because when you start something so new like nanomedicine, there is uh, other problems than when you are just developing drugs. And this is what we are talking about here. And the first speaker talking about 3D printing and medical devices, issues uh, of patients, Patient safety is uh, Elise Feldhans. Fitzhans. Fe oh, sorry. There's no L. It's okay. I, I, I forgot my glasses. I <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Three short ladies not wearing glasses. It's wonderful. Okay. We, we then we just start before I make a mess of myself. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm very honored and pleased to be back at Cleanham after a, a long time away. And the field has changed rapidly from the point of view of science, but not so much from the point of view of law. And I probably am the only lawyer speaking, certainly today, but maybe at the whole conference. I am very privileged and honored to tell you that as of Saturday, so less than a week ago, I am now the president-elect of the Virginia Mountain Valley Lawyers Alliance. I used to just be the chair of the Science and Technology Committee. And what that means is that we can create a prospect for really developing detailed discussion of the issues I'm going to present today. And I want to tell you also that these issues that I'm discussing were pretty much discussed in my book, Global Health Impacts of Nanotechnology Law, that's based on my doctorate from the Geneva School of Diplomacy in International Relations. It's also available in French for people like my husband who prefer French. And if, so I'm going to look at 3D printing of medical devices, issues of patient safety from the point of view of the law. And I, although I'm a lawyer, please don't throw tomatoes and eggs at me. Um, I'm a lawyer from a long, long time ago, but I also have a um, master's of science in public health from Johns Hopkins, where I looked at informed consent during genetic testing. And I'm also um, in the process of becoming a master of laws in global health law at Georgetown University, which I'm extremely proud of. So this is how you can find me. And as a lawyer, I'm obliged to tell you my perspective. Where am I coming from in this discussion? And my working assumption that's been throughout my writing right from the time I started my studies in nanotechnology is that the literature in the science calls nanotechnology a revolution because of the way we view physical properties of matter and bunches of stuff I don't understand. But the word revolution was coming up again and again. And the revolution for commerce that will come from the products and has already come from the products will revolutionize public health. That's my bias. So as a policymaker now, not as the point of view of someone starting research in the lab, it's very important to define the issue and have goals. And the challenge, if you're a scientist, and looking at fine tuning something like medical devices, like nanoscale materials in food, is does the nature of engineered nanostructured materials and devices present new safety and health risks? And by the way, that doesn't mean it doesn't have old risks. You know, if you use titanium dioxide, it's on a bunch of bad guy lists long before nanotechnology but there are safe ways of using it. This is a lovely, lovely way to phrase a research problem, but it's very technical if you're approaching a legislator or regulator who may know nothing about nanotechnology, may never have heard of the stuff, may think the price of the toll for the bridge is a much more important policy problem affecting their ability to get reelected. Then you want something much less complex. And this big picture question that I like to look at is how can the benefits of nanotechnology, those pretty promises that we're already living and enjoying, how can the benefits of nanotechnology be realized while proactively minimizing risk? So that's always in the back of my mind. And the legal dilemma is we want that innovation. We want those cool toys. We want to send the, the actor who was a star in Star Trek 
into outer space just as if he was an astronaut, even if it's 60 years later. We like that stuff, but we don't want to engender liability for unforeseen harms that we might have known about or that we could have really never imagined. We don't want that. So for the purpose of analysis, the way I map this in my writing and in my brain is that there are really three very diverse realms that have to come together for these building blocks of policy, for this very simple question about what is it we're doing with nanotechnology. And you have public health, or now we call it global health, but, but the, the nuts and bolts of how do you protect people from whether it's a virus or a fall in the workplace or a bad product on the market, public health worries about that and quantifies the reactions people have, good epidemiology and biostats. And then you have nanotechnology and a whole bunch of emerging technologies that interact with health in that way. And you have international law. And I will confess, I love this picture because I took it inside the Palais des Nations where this is the Swiss representative to a meeting. And he said, yes, you can take me at my work. Because we today, with that question I just gave you, are looking straight in the middle in that teeny little place where all that stuff interacts. So you have to know a lot of stuff from a lot of places. And Dr. Mark Hoover, who is one of the advisors for my doctoral thesis, had actually come up with this particular graphic, which I love, besides the fact that I really like Mark Hoover. What I love about it is he's a research scientist who gave his life to NIOSH so that he could work on things like the OECD committees and the ISO standards. So he's actually a scientist making law without ever having gone to law school. And I find that fascinating. And these are the realms in his personal experience where he has interacted with working on law. So what does all this mean, Elise? Well, here's my poster child for nanotechnology, Lady Gaga, because we're going to talk for a moment about operationalizing some of the law around nanotechnology. And I mean, everything about her is related to nanotechnology. Her costumes, the materials in her makeup and costumes, the way that it's broadcast around the world, the telecommunications that she used during COVID-19 in order to make it possible for people to stay home and have a free concert. Everything about her is possible because of nanotechnology, including her father's wealth from guest Wi-Fi. So she's a great example of what we can do very nicely. And what I want to look at extremely briefly, because I only have limited time, and I would love to be asked to think about this in detail another day, is 3D printed medical devices. Well, you guys know better than I do what 3D printing is. I will simply say that the FDA medical applications of 3D printing talks about it as identical copies of the same device. And it's also sometimes called patient matched, according to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States. So we're talking about patient-specific devices. We're talking about this really cool promise of biocompatibility and making things that one person needs without having to go through a whole inventory of thousands of things and figure out what fits them. We're thinking about how to use the process to manufacture living organs. There is a National Institutes of Health website where people are crowdsourcing their information about organs and what they think they're going to do to make 3D printable organs. I don't know who vets that information. I know it's an, a real NIH site. I don't know if the information is always good and reliable, but it's out there. There's this idea of the future. And it's in an early stage of development compared to where it was, say, five or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 100 years ago. And it's going to be accomplished by bringing together several different types of technologies. So the choice of technology is going to depend on a lot of factors. And the most common technology seems to be power bed fusion, commonly used with titanium and nylon. That's FDA that said that. And this is where they said it. And what's interesting about this guidance 
this discussion paper, it's not even a guidance, excuse me. This discussion paper is a product of the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. To put it extremely oversimplified, but to give you a point of reference, what happened in COVID, people needed stuff and there were no supply lines. You couldn't go out, you couldn't get things. And people with 3D printers started printing medical devices in huge amounts. And according to FDA, this is sort of how it falls among uh, healthcare providers and points of contact with patients. And they said that there's all this stuff going on. The device design stage may include a standard design with discrete pre-specified sizes and models and patient-matched devices. So this is a list of the steps that FDA looks at and when these devices are created. But as a lawyer, what I find extremely disconcerting is that there's no real law here. And what's really strange is when you look through this five-step process, this is process-oriented, this may be excellent 3D printing 101, I don't know, but when you look at this in comparison to the traditional supply lines that were not at all feasible during COVID, but created this precedent that we're still using now as COVID recedes in its importance, people are saying, you know, that's a really cool idea. We could have this system and we could do this. The problem here is if you compare the traditional model, there are steps along the way and at each step, there are opportunities for confirming reliability, for inspection, for going back and saying what's going on here. But the problem in this model that we've increasingly said was a great idea and is really cool for other reasons is that the end user and the, the manufacturer are the same person. And if you had, for example, a small dental clinic making implants, who's to even know what was created, let alone inspect it and check quality and whether it's the right materials? And so there's this potential to have the little thread that unravels the whole sweater here. There's a potential that we won't really have access to the very same regulatory system that's protecting consumers for years and years. FDA happens to be over 100 years old. They didn't always do medical devices, but they have a history of protecting people. And so, this is raising traditional concerns that I only have time to raise the questions because I see this potential end run around a pre-existing beautiful regulatory apparatus that has historically protect people pretty well. So we want to know when errors occur, how are we going to allocate responsibility? And how are we even going to know that those problems have occurred? We have this trade-off. We have this rapid delivery that we needed during COVID. There was no dispute. Three in the morning in the hospital, and you've got to get that person to stay alive another couple of hours, and nobody's going to be able to deliver anything sooner. Fine. Exigency is a reason to have an exception under valid law. But now we're in that aftermath. And what's going to happen as we increasingly say it's okay to 3D print things without this regulatory oversight that we've ha lived with for hundreds of years? We see these people are starting to, to 3D print guns, and that's a public health legal question. So there are some quick conclusions that I want to give you because there are questions for 3D printing in medical care. And I want people to think about this. There's no right answer here. And actually today, this afternoon, there's no real answer. These are new problems because when we developed 3D printing, there was licensing, there was oversight, and then COVID just kind of made it take off in a way that was not anticipated. So there's going to be conflicts of interest regarding new technologies. And how do we as a society know that the treatments we've chosen are correct and actually work? Back to the COVID model, if you could keep a patient alive a few more hours or days or weeks, that was a success. That doesn't mean it was the right treatment or the right thing to be doing with the right methods. What it means is we kept them alive longer in a time when we did not know what to do, where it was 
consensus that we did not know what to do. And the job was to keep them alive. Does that mean that's the, the base, the, the underpinning of what you want to do next? So will there be requirements under law that people accept the specific treatment? And if they don't accept that treatment, are they going to have some kind of a consequence? Maybe they won't get other treatment. Maybe they'll get a different trajectory of treatment, and they won't be allowed to, to retrap. So we've, we're following a path that nanotechnology has sort of made clear might happen for decades, but we haven't really done anything. And in the little few seconds left, I am not going to tell you yet my final conclusion. I want you to think about this for another day and another talk. We are on the cusp of having a new version of liability because we will have so many influences and so many actors, even when the manufacturer is the end user. The traditional line of direct causation will not apply. And I want you to think about that the day will come when we will need a new theory, which we've started to see in the European laws, such as the global harmonization of chemical safety and the Metacrime Convention. Because in conclusion, my take home message is, scientists must be intelligent consumers of the law without becoming lawyers. You don't all have to go to law school, but you have to think about this dimension of these issues. We are on the cusp of a very important change of how we structure material usage. And that means how we will look at future liability. So I want you to participate in that. I want you to chew on the questions I gave you and enjoy having your say, because nanotechnology's revolution for science and commerce is revolutionizing public health. And I thank you for your attention.